welcome to the October Threat Modeling Connect Global Monthly Meetup. Uh, if you're new to Threat Modeling Connect, we are a community uh, dedicated to threat modeling and supporting each other as we improve and upskill our threat modeling practices. So we host, we're the community that's really big on events. We host monthly global meetups on Zoom like this one. And we also do virtual threat modeling hackathon in the spring. And our uh, the annual global conference is actually twice a year. The second one just wrapped up a month ago in San Francisco. And you may have seen it as you join. Uh, we are also launching the threat modeling connect local meetup starting next month in Barcelona, Tokyo, and London. So if you happen to be in those cities, um, that's something that you don't want to miss out on. So with that, I'm really excited uh, to introduce to you the topic of this month, an objective-oriented approach to threat modeling. And joining us uh, is Matthew McDonald, a seasoned threat modeling practitioner and an active contributor to not just our community, but the broader threat modeling and AppSec community as well. So I'll let Matthew introduce himself in more details in just a bit. Just give you an idea of what to expect and in the meetings today. So the goal of our monthly meetup like this is really to give you a safe place to share real world experiences, examples, ideas in threat modeling, um, and not feeling that you know, you'll be judged by any way. But it's a really, really safe and supportive space to share. And to do that, we follow the Shenzhen House Rule, where you're free to use information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. Quick overview of the agenda um, for today. So after the intro, we'll take a group photo. So that's a PMC meetup tradition. And Matthew will take us through the presentation. After the presentation, we will break into small group discussions. And this is where you will delve deeper into the topic today. You will go through a exercise on picking a framework um, shared by Matthew today, Pick, picking a principle from the framework that Matthew will be sharing today um, and explore how that can, what that can look like for your threat modeling efforts. And after the small group discussions, we'll all come back to the main sessions for quick readouts and insight sharing. And then I'll wrap up the session with some quick announcements and a closing uh -huh. remark. Okay, without further ado, I'd um, like to take a group photos as a tradition for our meetups. If you feel comfortable, feel free to uh, turn on your camera. If not, that's totally fine. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Matthew McDonald here. Uh, I am located in the Eastern United States. Um, I started my career about 13 years ago as a software engineer in the banking industry and uh, transferred out of that into security architecture, software architecture, uh, and then to application security, risk management, and kind of the gambit there. I've always been very passionate in software development, application security, and threat modeling, and have been threat modeling in one way or another for probably the last 10 years or so. Um, and uh, thank you very much for letting me join in here and uh, give you a brief presentation. So let me share my screen. Okay, great. Uh, so approaches to threat modeling. Um, it's not as common anymore, really, that we talk about the human nature approach to threat modeling. When I first started threat modeling, it was really a whiteboard exercise where you invited a, a large group of individuals from architects to other engineers into a room and you whiteboarded out this threat model. Um, Really, today, the majority of enterprise threat modeling practices uh, are tightly coupled to the features that are within the tool that that organization has chosen. So the approach to threat modeling and the actual exercise itself tends to be, again, very tightly focused on that, that the features provided by that, that tool set for threat modeling that has been provided by the organization. This presentation is really going to take a tool agnostic approach. It focuses on the human nature, the human technical analysis of decomposing a solution and performing a threat modeling exercise. Um, one thing I like to stress, I, I was told when I joined my first uh, TMC session was that uh, just remember, there's no right or wrong way to perform a threat model. And, and I really do live by that. I think it's great that 
in this area of AppSec is, uh, you know, there's really no right or way, right, right or wrong way to do this. It's really like painting a picture. It's kind of your own formula. Um, I, I like for this to be a thought experiment presentation. This isn't hard factual evidence in the sense that um, it, I really a lot hope that you can take this and interpret it into your own way. Um, and uh, and really uh, use this as a thought experiment. So in the presentation, I'm going to walk through four guiding principles and how I envision they could empower a threat modeling approach. Um, the examples of the interpretations, uh, even though they are pulled from object-oriented design principles, they don't align 100% if you are familiar from the, the strict software development aspect of object-oriented principles and these principles in general, they don't align 100% uh, just due to the fact that developing software and threat modeling are completely different practices. This is just how I've re-envisioned them to maybe help me in my day-to-day -day activities of threat modeling. So those principles, um, again, coming from a developer background, I've always really appreciated this, this structure, this guiding structure that these uh, principles have provided me. Um, and that's why I wanted to build a presentation around using them in a threat modeling exercise. So the principles that I'm going to talk about are abstraction or the focus of displaying only necessary information, encapsulation or bundling methods and data of a conclusive feature within a model, um, inheritance, the process of deriving key aspects from another component, and uh, polymorphism, which to me describes the potential for something to be utilized in several different forms. And I'm going to talk about, again, my interpretation and my usage of these different principles within a threat modeling exercise. Um, again, one of my goals here is that if I can get attendees to leave this with even one new consideration that you could use in your day-to-day -day threat modeling exercise based off of these principles. So first off, talking about abstraction, um, what I what we mean here is modeling the relevant components and interactions of a solution as references to define abstract representations of a system. Um, this can be great when you're trying to threat model a large monolithic style platform. And what abstraction talks about is breaking down each of the individual components into their into their true solution spaces and allowing you to not only clean up what would typically be a very large monolithic threat model, but allowing for the reuse of various solution components within and reference them, reference models per se, within uh, multiple other threat models. Um, later, I'm going to speak about uh, inheritance, and I believe abstraction and inheritance in this usage play well together due to the fact that when you're creating this reference models, you can inherit various aspects of those models. Um, this has a lot of implications on efficiency due to the fact of the reuse of potential parts of a threat model. Typically, within an enterprise environment, we're going to have various component spaces that are used by multiple solutions. And if we take the approach of abstracting that, that component out into its own threat model, the efficiency comes from being able to reuse that reference model across other threat models um, and then using inheritance that I'll show later on to kind of pull some of that information across as well. Now, what do I mean by this? So let's just take a very basic example of a banking web application. We have a very common scenario of a user who's going through a load balancer. They are um, using this banking web application, which has a database and a, a corporate logging solution. What we mean by abstraction and reference models is that it's it, there's a lot of power in taping taping something like a shared solution or a shared component space being this corp logging solution, separating that out completely into its own threat model. Over here on the right, we talk about a corp logging solution, which has its own REST APIs, its own logging controllers, its own database. Essentially, it has its own attack surface itself. This corp logging solution. Um, could undergo its entirely own threat model, its own attack service consideration, its own attack vectors and threat actors within itself. And then once created and established and managed, could be referenced by other solutions that we know use this corp logging solution. And then you would reference it in however you design your threat models, whatever tools you use, you would try to reference that corporate logging solution or whatever that shared component was 
Um, you know, it'd be great if you could click link off to it or, or whatever your tool feature allows you to do, but get to that shared reference model and access all of the fruitful work that was done by another engineer or, or maybe even yourself from within that, that single solution. One of the bonuses here is uh, for new product development efforts, actually. Um, you have to envision that for new product developments, uh, efforts, when the business or engineers are thinking about the business requirements or what they're actually trying to achieve, if, if your threat modeling practice has built out uh, a majority of all of the shared solutions within your enterprise and you have threat modeled those shared solutions, that could be provided up to new product development efforts and say, here's your typical corp logging solution, here's your LLM system, here's, your, here's our authentication controllers. These are things that you're likely going to need to use when you're building this new product. And here are all of the threats and countermeasures and existing controls that already exist within these shared components. So it's not something that I've ever actually seen before. It's a bit mature and advanced in a concept. But if you used abstraction in the right way, you broke out all of the various components within your enterprise and developed individual threat models for those, I think you could actually add a, a pretty big bonus to new product development efforts and, and presenting them the various solutions that they will likely use when building their new product and presenting them the threats, risks, countermeasures that they're going to face. So, a bit of a bonus there. It's big, like you're saying. It's here, we'll go ahead and uh, can we get Christopher? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. All right. So next, encapsulation. Uh, my usage of encapsulation and threat modeling exercises to help identify the attack surface itself. So software architects and developers will often only explain the happy path. And, and these are usually group exercises. When you're building a threat model, hopefully you're not doing it by yourself in a silo. Hopefully you're working with engineers and the architects who have built the actual system. But in, when you are, from my experience, they're going to explain the happy path scenario, the utilization of that product or solution. The customer comes in, they see this, they do this, great. They get the feature that they want and they're out. This isn't great from a threat modeling perspective, and that's the point of a threat modeling exercise is to really analyze that attack surface, envision different attack vectors, envision different chains of attacks and threat actors. And in, in the usage of encapsulation here, we're really trying to ask ourselves, but, but what if it was used a different way? The solution is likely not going to be used 100% as, as designed. One of the most important aspects of a threat model is the analysis of, again, the solution's attack surface. The encapsulation of software itself uh, can be correlated with potential threats from an overexpansive attack surface, and threats should be considered from the perspective of, again, not only what are they doing today, but what could you do? What I mean by this in a model example is, again, we'll go back to a banking web solution scenario where you have a user, they're using a banking web application, has its own database, it has its own solution space over on the left. There's a completely different product team who have developed a chatbot service. What goes into chatbot services? Well, you have large language models. Um, they have summarization services. But this chatbot service team has already run into the pitfall of understanding that they need to defend against prompt injection style attacks. And they have developed a prompt sanitization engine internal to their system. That's great. This is likely its own threat model and exists. And somebody has identified they have a control in place to defend against prompt injection. And the bank, banking web application utilizes the Gen AI chatbot service today to communicate with users on the front end, right? But what if tomorrow the banking web application team decides they want more than just the chatbot service? They need LLM summarization. For some reason, they want to expand and provide this feature to the user. The only LLM today exists within the chatbot service team. And the banking solution team, banking web application team wants access to this. This is that future encapsulation concept of what are they doing today, but what would they have access to? Can this banking web application, because it can connect to the Gen AI service chatbot system, is there proper network segregation in place where they cannot connect directly to the LLM? And do they understand by connecting directly to the LLM that they're bypassing prompt sanitization and have now exposed to the public internet the ability for prompt injection? 
How well has the chatbot service been encapsulated? And that's what we mean by this principle. Have they only exposed the appropriate features for the appropriate users and integration points for that are required to do business? If not, then their ability for in the future for somebody to connect something that was never meant to be connected. Inheritance. Inheritance can become a powerful tool. Um, I spoke earlier about abstraction, and I think inheritance and abstraction play well together in this usage scenario. This is personally my favorite usage of the principles. Um, again, you recall how uh, abstracted models are the shared or reference models in the threat modeling space. And what I mean by inheritance is I would like to use this to consider the chain of attacks or chain of threats that can be broken down in a data flow diagram when you take into consideration shared or reference models. Um, a new measurement of importance to threat remediation can be provided by showcasing the cascading effects of threats as they transfer from one solution to referenced or inherited systems. And what I mean by that is, I'm just going to give a very basic example of, let's say we have a generative AI system that was developed. It was tagged internal. This is an internal system to the organization. But during the threat modeling exercise, the threat modeler identified that the Gen AI system itself lacks malicious content and PII sanitization. So we know this is not in place today. And appropriately, we have identified threat T001. But we've marked that as a low because this is tagged internal to the organization, not, not publicly accessible, lower risk. Later down the road, we have an engineering group who develops a new sales department Gen AI email system. This allows the sales department to generate uh, from a large language model sales emails. But to do this, they must use the referenced or shared component from the Gen AI system. If we go back to the abstraction point and a model, this would look like one model referencing another model. But in that sense, we should also take inheritance and, and, into consideration. If the sales department's Gen AI email system is tagged publicly accessible and we reference the Gen AI system, we should first inherit this, this threat. But secondly, we should reconsider the risk of the threat because we now have a publicly accessible sales department application that is inheriting this threat from an internal Gen AI system, maybe it's not low anymore. Maybe it's medium, maybe it's high. That's open to consideration. But inheritance plays a role here in the fact that if you appropriately have broken up all of your models and you are referencing these models and reusing them, and there have been threats and countermeasures identified, and it goes both ways, not just threats, but you can also inherit controls and countermeasures. But if done correctly, then you could alter the actual residual risk of a threat based off of that inheritance. I am running out of time, Shani. Let me get to this next slide here real quick. Polymorphism. The ability to reference inherited properties or methods from a component abstraction in different ways within a model. So my usage of polymorphism here is not directly intended to help with the identification of threats. However, I think it's a strategy that could be used to build more reusable and better described models. Um, this kind of goes back to the shared model perspective again for a moment, but it talks about the different ways that we may build solution spaces that have different usages based off of different customers. And I think the best scenario to explain that would be the concept of a software as a service provider. So here we have a diagram where we kind of explain that this big fancy SaaS uh, uh, solution provider um, has a web interface, but their access control provider, they, they offer to their customers that you can implement this or utilize either LDAP, two-factor, or local credentials, right? Um, likely, you have already developed a, a threat model of this uh, separate solution space. So this access control provider would be the abstract shared reference model. And inside that, you have drawn separate paths of is the usage of this model implemented with LDAP? Is it implemented with local credentials? And what are the paths within that model of, of data flow, depending on what your choice is, what servers are communicated with, where does data travel? And if you've done this appropriately, you could potentially, depending on your tool set, tag each of these reference models with the implementation specific details. So that you can say customer A is using our access control provider, which has its own threat model, but they have implemented it with two-factor or they are using our access control provider, but they have implemented it with local credentials. That way you can kind of pass metadata 
over to that shared component and show the real polymorphism aspect of the reusability and something that could be uh, implemented in, in different ways. Okay, 16 minutes, went over a little bit. <laughs> Very good, so much Matthew. All right, so now that's adding to the breakout rooms. We will have three breakout rooms um, who will be assigned automa automatically. Uh, we will all come back at 11.45 Eastern time. Okay, great. So um, insight sharing, I think we'll just pass it around to the different uh, small groups leads and just maybe touch on one or two sticky notes that were discussed. Is that, is that correct, Shani? Yeah. Okay. So from my group, well, first of all, everybody, thank you for participating and staying on for the small groups, a bit different scenario rather than just um, getting to hide as a lurker in the presentation and watch everything and having to participate, but uh, hopefully it was fun for everybody. Um, from my group, um, I actually did get feedback that they liked the small group style meeting and the participation there. They actually enjoyed that. Um, and then um, somebody commented, could these principles allow for time to be freed up to go deeper on threat models? So again, this goes back to the efficiency concept of if you built out all of your abstraction or reference models and you had your inheritance in place and you built out your metadata for polymorphism, could that free up your time when pulling this back together inside of a technology to allow you to go deeper on threat models? And then maybe where do you draw the line? How deep do you go on threat models? Which I didn't have a great answer for because I think it's open to interpretation. Um, but yeah, we, we, uh, we did not stick to the rules and picked one principle. We kind of talked about all the principles. Um, yeah. I just think there was feedback on all those. Um, maybe we can go down, uh, Team Claire and Simon. Yeah, I think I, I can take this one. So we we uh, we're focusing on abstraction, um, uh, and I think maybe one one insight uh, we were discussing is maybe what one of the main differences between developers and security engineers is developers always want to abstract things. So if they only have to care about their code, they're just gonna just gonna focus on their code and nothing else. While security engineers have to de-abstract, like they have to look what's like being used in the background. Uh, are any of the open source libraries vulnerable? Um, are you, if you are deployed on a cloud environment, does it have any misconfigurations? Are you using an S3 bucket that is misconfigured? Is it public? You know, that, that, that kind of thing, which developers usually just wanna quickly go through and, and, and have the, the logic of the happy path, like you said, running uh, uh, regardless of all of these things. So we as security engineers always want to de-abstract and look behind these things. And 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 this is where like this is probably going to be really useful if we are able to do it in this order. If you are able to de-abstract what's being used, have a look at it, review it, uh, and make sure it's it's fine. The cloud, let's let's take cloud configuration as an example. So what, what you're using in terms of like the cloud infrastructure has been reviewed, it's fine, it doesn't have any misconfigurations, your buckets have encryption, they are not public, they have proper access control and so on. And then we can abstract that, mm -hmm. for example, as let's say an inf uh, infrastructure as code template or as a service or whatever uh, for, for developers. And then developers can reuse this thing, which I guess is a win-win situation because now they, they are gonna abstract this, they like abstraction and, and it's easier for them. At the same time, because this has been reviewed before being uh, abstracted or being like uh, provided or, or made available for uh, for developers, uh, we are we have enough confidence in its secure security posture as well. So so the point here is like for that goes for services for cloud configuration for for anything. If you are able to review it, make sure it's fine, uh, and and then abstract it back again. This re re removes a lot of the friction between security engineers and developers because of the fact that like we look at things differently they want things abstracted we want to look into the uh um, what's between the lines and, and de-abstract everything yeah that's good that's really good feedback awesome thank you thank you um, let's come down to team tobias and alicia yes um we were taking a look at inheritance um, one of the first things we were talking about was, um, I think it was also in your presentation about um, how it helps categorizing uh, the threat severity based on the context. So if the 
um, threat is um, is appearing in uh, more than one um, systems. Um, you can see how the threat severity can change based on the context. Um, we were also taking a look at um, how the um, um, how the mitigation um, how you would pri prioritize the mitigation of the threat that is widely inherited. So um, if one of the threats um, is appearing more often in the inheritance, it could be um, a good idea to take a look at that, uh, that mitigation first um, and how you could use the concept of inheritance uh, to modularize um, some concepts to, um, to so that you uh, speed up uh, the whole process. That's about it. Awesome, great. Again, thank you, thank you very much for the uh, feedback. It's great to hear that um, we had some some input from the various teams on some of the principles and good feedback at that. Um. I guess uh, we're at the point, a, a bit of a take home message for myself. So again, just to reiterate, there's many approaches to threat models, methodologies, tools in the threat modeling space uh, that each lend a different perspective uh, to achieving really the same goal. It's again, it's important to remember there's no right way to perform a threat modeling exercise. I hope that the, the presentation, if anything, triggered a bit of your explorative nature and provided you with maybe new viewpoints to consider when you're performing a threat modeling exercise. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew, for this presentation and for shedding light on this um, new approach to threat modeling. And as Matthew mentioned, if there's nothing else, hope that this will give everyone an inspirations and pick your explorative nature um, as you think about threat modeling as you approach threat modeling. And kudos again um, to our facilitator team, Alicia, player, uh, Matthew yourself, um, Kaysen, Simon, and Tobias for help stepping up, being coming to facilitators and helping um, to create an engaging experience in the small group discussion. As I said, uh, we want the thing that we want, uh, the biggest thing that we want out of, us, um, out of this meetup is really create a safe space for people to share and um, to participate, to collaborate. Um, and that's why we want to make our session as interactive as possible. And if it's, it's not, possible without um, the help of our facilitators. Awesome. So some announcements for our upcoming events. I'm just, I'm gonna include our event calendar here so you can hover it over um, to check out our um, upcoming events. We're going to have the global meetup again next month. And so in November, uh, we're gonna talk about AI. Uh, we have Susanna Cox who will be joining us um, to uh, expand her recent talk at the OWASP Global AFSA conference in San Francisco, where she talks about threat modeling in the age of AI. So the presentation that we will give in our next meetup will be a, um, we'll delve deeper into that topic and will be an expansion of her, her talk that she gave to um, the OWASP audi audience, given you know, we are threat modeling practitioners. Um, so she will um, go deeper into this topic. Um, we having three meetups uh, by the end of the year. The London and Barcelona one uh, will be in, uh, at the end of November and have a Tokyo meetup in early December. Happen to be in those areas, you, there's something that you don't want to miss, so check them out. And finally, last but not least, uh, we recently relaunched our online forum as a place for we to for all of us to continue the discussion, to stay connected while we're not in a meeting like this. Um, we will share the event recap of this session, um, all the top takeaways from the discussions as well, and the recording, the slides in the forum, uh, hopefully later today, if not tomorrow. And this is also a place where you will share or get the resources on, around anything for modeling. And it's also where we will be sharing the speaking of volunteering opportunities with you if you're interested in um, joining us for the sessions, to speak at the session, or to become one of our volunteers. And head over to our online forum and become a member to stay updated on everything about this community. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.